I'm Dave Frederick, and I teach at the University of Arkansas. I teach Greek and Latin, among other things, and I also uh, teach Roman art history, and especially my research focus is on uh, spatial relations and decoration in Pompeii. And so hopefully you'll see by the end of this presentation why I happen to be here on this stage, which, by the way, I'm delighted to be on. It's such a beautiful space and such, I think, really important conference. Uh, and so what I'm going to do, just to give you an overview, is talk a little bit about the research project that got me into 3D stuff and eventually led me to the game engine Unity. Then we'll explore a few models in Unity to see what's possible. And again, this will basically be snapshots of three works in progress, but you'll be able to see, I think, how you can embed analytical tools and uh, uh, annotation into a Unity model, which also allows free exploration. So we'll just, with that, we'll just dive in. And so the beginning for me was the Digital Pompeii project, but that's actually not really the beginning. The beginning for me was trying to start an Excel spreadsheet of where th themes in Pompeii were located based on this Italian encyclopedia, Pompeii Pitture e Mosaici. And after about three days in the library trying to do that, I'm like, this is insane. We need a 3D database of this particular resource. Uh, and, and my initial thought was that would be really handy because if you've been to Pompeii, you know, a lot of stuff has been moved out. Uh, like it's off the walls, it's faded from the walls, it's in the Naples Museum, it's in other museums. Wouldn't it be great if we could take all that evidence that's scattered now and pull it back into the virtual space so we can evaluate that whole decorative context? That was my initial thought about the problem. <clears throat> but then I realized that's not really the problem in Pompeii. The problem in Pompeii is a little bit different, and that is our fundamental way of thinking about space in Pompeii is based on elite texts, and if the houses in Pompeii don't live up to those texts, they're found lacking. And therefore, we have a descriptive vocabulary of space in Pompeii based on these elite room names that are very poorly defined and very blunt. And so, to get at what I wanted to get at, which was the spatial distribution of themes in Pompeian wall painting, that series of names was just not going to work. That led me into a different approach to defining rooms. Uh, and I, this seems a little off topic, but I think it's all going to sort of come together. <laughs> You're like dots and arrows, awesome. And so, what this really is, is an approach to space that treats it as a network, just like you treat uh, like you could graph an internet network using nodes and edges or a social network using nodes and edges. These rooms are just like people from my standpoint. They're either well connected or poorly connected. But that gives me a neutral statistical way of defining a space. How well connected? In what way is it connected to the other rooms? But that's not the only thing. It's not just physical connection through edges, but also visibility. Like how visible is a room? How exposed is it? How integrated is it visually? And so with those two tools, I could start to develop a, spatial, a visual spatial analysis of rooms in Pompeii based on these statistics rather than the traditional names. And what I then wanted was a way to see those relationships in the 3D space. And so, and don't worry about comprehending this block graph. All it's telling you is these three rooms are sort of like each other in these statistical ways and not like each other in other statistical ways. Can we start to develop uh, a set of categories of rooms in Pompeii based on those statistics, which are, in a sense, neutral, rather than the traditional names, which actually don't tell us very much? OK, then the last part of this puzzle for me was we, we're going to need an art database, which, of course, doesn't really exist now for Pompeii. So this is really hubristic, this whole project, like the idea of trying to tackle this situation, but there is no other way if you're really going to track these relationships. So the next step began, uh, emerged as keeping track of what's in the top zone of a Pompeian wall, the middle zone, the bottom zone. And the Pompeians are pretty obliging in terms of giving you a grid, pretty obliging. But then they take enough liberties with it to make it really challenging. Okay, so our next step is to keep track of what's where on the wall, how does that relate to the spatial connectivity of the room and its visibility. So it's sort of a holistic approach to finding out what's where. For, and for me, in terms of museum studies, can you convey that argument then once you're in the 3D space of a Unity, a, a game engine model? Because then you start to leverage the specific rhetorics that are built in uh, to some of those, to what a user expects when they use a 3D model. And what they expect, and we're not going to really see that today because I think it's still emergent. What they expect is a kind of game mechanic. That is, and whenever I have students walk through one of these Pompeian houses, after about two minutes, it's like, when do I shoot something? <laughs> All right? 
when is this going to be a game? Because right now I'm just walking around. And I think that that initial gaming impulse is something we can work with. And we just need to be thinking about game mechanics as a way of launching our historical questions within these spaces. Because if we don't, our users are expecting that and, and we're giving them something that doesn't fit their expectations of that space. Now we don't have to blindly follow those, but I think we can leverage that expectation. So anyhow, I put together this art database and it's coming together. This was the hardest part, believe me, still is. And so, but now we actually have about two houses entered of data. There's 400 houses in Pompeii, so we're getting there. Um, but the idea is then if you search, for instance, for Theseus in those houses, you will get a hit back for where Theseus is. And it turns out he's in two central zone middle paintings. If we search for cupids, we would find a different spatial distribution. We could then put that data against the spatial invisibility data and really start to have a triangulated analysis of these spaces. Then comes the unity model, and we'll see how this works out. It's going to be maybe a little dark for this space, but hopefully you'll be able to see a little bit of what's going on. So I'm going to flip over to that right now, uh, and that's that. And so you can see it behind me, and what we're going to do is just sort of walk in it. You can see we can look at this model, and it's freestanding on a plan of Pompeii right now, <laughs> which is pretty dorky, really. Um, but on the other hand, I didn't want as yet to try to create a skybox with mountains and the undulating terrain of Pompeii, because that's its own problem. And I really don't want to get at that yet. I'm more interested in getting at what's happening really on the insides of the houses, though I would stress that's not unrelated to what's happening out in the street. So I don't want to minimize this. I'm just saying at this stage of the project, we're really concentrating on the insides. So we're going to go ahead and move inside. Uh, and you can see that some great stuff that a game engine lets you do is fake things like sculpture, like that lion's nose, which is real crude, by the way, but works. You can put things like water in the space, and so it starts to feel alive like a space can feel. Uh, and you can see if you were going to present a gallery space, this could be really, really powerful. And so, uh, and this model is actually largely built by students, and we'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, so I'm responsible for some parts of it. Uh, they're responsible for other parts of it. It's really a group effort, and I definitely learn as much from them or more than they learn from me. And we'll look at a second project where that's definitely the case. So you, as you can see also plants are getting better in games. I'm just going to jump over here. So you can see we can go out to the garden. It's kind of dark in this particular circumstance, but plants are getting better, and they're becoming sort of a focus of what we want to accomplish because Gardens in Roman houses are really important. They're thematically important. The plantings are often specific. And so I don't want to minimize that aspect of these houses. But getting back to the visual spatial analysis part of it, one thing you can do is simply bring up some of these graphs right in the space and say, OK, this, is a, this looks like between this centrality. So these nodes around the atrium are really big. And you can see this is a certain kind of space. If you have that kind of space with that kind of betweenness score, is it often decorated a specific kind of way? Uh, and then, OK, we can test that. What about if we want to test eigenvector centrality, which sounds scary, but it's just the basis for Google's page rank. Like, that's where the information is. That's what I, that means it's a node that's not necessarily doesn't have a lot of connections. It's well connected to other well connected nodes. So you can see what happened when we push that button is that these guys got lots bigger. My blunt assumption is that's where the information is, i.e., the fancy wall painting will be back there. Okay, so it becomes a really useful tool to try to explore that. But it's also not the only tool you need because these guys over here also have a high eigenvector score and they got a mud floor and no wall painting. Okay, so you need a nuanced analysis. So the other part of the puzzle is really important as it turns out. If I turn that off and turn this on, that's the visibility graph. So it shows you what spaces are visibly well connected in the house. And this turns out to be really interesting. Because you can see out in the garden is a shrine that peeks through the window at you as you approach this visual main drag of the house. It's like a visual landmark, as is the painting in the barrel vault up there, as is this painting of Dionysus, which has sort of got a forced perspective tunnel to draw you in as a landmark into the space. Is that happening in a lot of Pompeian houses is my question. And the way to get at it is through a Unity model, in my opinion. Something that's playable and also shareable because these can be published to the web, which means that anyone can go online and look at this analysis and make their own analysis. Experts can disagree in virtual space, but they can't if you don't have the space. 
So that's the, that's the impetus for that particular uh, use of Unity. <coughs> the other thing is you can track user movement. You can cube up to space and see who goes where and spends how long and looks at what. And that's, so we have that right up, like this is a guy who went in there. <coughs> He's a gamer, you can tell, because he jumped through the window. <laughs> you know, you can see the little line goes right through the window. I'm like, oh, come on. And so um, you have to think about that. Like they'll use the space differently. So you can't assume the 21st century assumptions about this space are Roman assumptions. But you can track user movement, and that's a very valuable source of data in its own right to see how the paintings are attracting the eye and shaping movement in the space. So that's that project, and that's how I got on it. It's because of those questions that I hit upon Unity, and that really changed my career because uh, I just started doing a lot of 3D stuff and also inviting more and more students to do that work with me and, and in fact, needing them because there's no way one person is going to do this stuff. No way. And, so, and also, students become very voracious when they get hooked on this, and they really want to know about Pompeian houses. They really want to know. Uh, so if they work on a house, they go to Pompeii and see what it's actually like. Tears often ensue as a result. So, but you can also use Unity as a presentation platform. And that is, I, just, I gave a paper at the AIA, the uh, Archaeological Institute of America, just in Unity, no PowerPoint, no keynote. And what I did was just say, well, why don't we just, uh, whoop, let's go back a step, forward a step. Sorry about that. If we can do that, can't we just superimpose on that as we move through the space at key junctures, just bring up the points of your argument. It's very simple. You just press a button and that's, in this particular space, these Romans, this particular house owner was making double back and around his garden water feature in a very complex way. And I thought, well, that's a little bit like this Lowe's house argument that I read before. Let's, let's see if we can start making some connections between the complexities of those two spaces. Easily done in unity, just as if you were, but you can still move in 3D space. So that's a lot more powerful than an ordinary keynote or PowerPoint. Okay, then an expansion of this became, well, if I got these houses that I built, can I use them to deliver online content more broadly? And this speaks to um, a myth course that we're developing online for the University of Arkansas, which we've codenamed Muthos Unbound, because our sense is that, and the way we're approaching this is to anchor the various kinds of mythology to the different pieces of the house, the mosaics on the floor, the sculptures, the wall painting, the dishes, the plants, all that stuff. So that when I can tell students that myth is everywhere in the ancient world, it's embedded on all kinds of surfaces, but playing this game brings that message home a lot more viscerally because that's how they enter the myth world. Uh, and so this basically is giving you an overview and I'm basically summarizing what I just said. Uh, and so it does have an, arching an overarching narrative of slavery to freedom that matches the student's ability to master mythology, which is governed by the ability to do these levels, but also by a lot of in-game writing assignments. So it's not divorce, it's not just playtime. There's a lot of serious consideration of how the game presents the myth as opposed to how the texts present the myth. Okay, and we got a quality matters thing going on, and you know, so there's like, we got to work with Blackboard, and that's the thing about Unity also, is now has SCORM integration, so we can work with the content manager, so it's very handy that way. Okay, and this is some student content. Well, I got a student working in ZBrush building Hercules, and it's coming along pretty well. So this is all student work, which, and this kid's about 20, and this is exactly the kinds of 3D skill sets that are going to be necessary. So I think that's really powerful. Here's a 3D Medusa as well. Okay, so how am I doing on time? 44 seconds, plenty of time. You can tell it's getting high tech when the chair comes out on stage. And so, <laughs> okay, so just a, a, a sort of set of snapshots of what students are creating in order to create this myth world of this game. Uh, and what I thought I'd do now is play a second, just very briefly, a second example of content for this. And this is basically your landing page. And you can look at this if you want to, pompeii.uark.edu, uh, house web demo, I'll put that back on, so you can see in a second. I know it went back. I'll put it back on, on the screen in just a second so you can write it down if you want to go look. And it'll download for you and play. So I'm going to play this just for a second and have a drink of water. And it, it's a little bit, there's some tricky stuff happening behind the scenes as this loads. Hopefully loads. Technology is always fun. Okay, so when you get into the space, it's again navigable. But because we went ahead and created characters that will come and talk to you. 
and welcome you to the house and want to have a conversation. And uh, we're just going to click through this guy. He's got a lot of personality. Um, and so this is the student's first effort, really, to create characters. So this is but not by any means our final go at this house owner. But it's getting there. You know, They're really getting there. And I think as a way of drawing students into these kinds of spaces, they, this can be really, really powerful. So I just thought, I, I think, given our time situation, I'm going to, that's probably enough, because you can go see it. And where can you go see it? Let me put that back there. And you can see that's the address right there, if you want to take a picture or, or whatever. So you can explore this uh, on your own. The thing about it is, is it also allows students or users to click on certain aspects of the environment for further information. It's interactive that way. OK, can I, should I go forward? Not yet? OK. So just in the last sort of very briefly project that we're working on right now, myself and Tom Hapgood, also a professor at the U of A, is a reconstruction of the 10th Street studio in New York City. Not the whole thing, because we rapidly determined that's going to be really hard. So what we're doing, can I go now? <laughs> OK, good. Uh, oh, that's the other thing, Oculus Rift. I brought it with me. It just came like two days ago, this headset thingy that's really immersive and wrap around. If you walk around, if you try to do it while standing, nausea can be a problem. Best played while seated. But if any of you would like, you can contact me if any of you would like a little trip through this Pompeii and stuff with the Oculus Rift on. It's really something. It's, it's, there's problems, but it's really going to be something. And so the last thing is this project. Uh, we're trying to recreate the circumstances of Church's exhibition of the Heart of the Andes. Because we figured that would give us a very focused moment in the history of the 10th Street Studio. A specific set of presentation characteristics or exhibition characteristics, including black drapery over a lot of the walls. We thought that was really handy for us from a modeling standpoint. So it reduced focusing on that, made our job easier. But also, it's really, really interesting to try to see how this painting was received in conditions of varying lighting inside the 10th Street Studio. What does its frame contribute? Because there's a rebuilt frame on it now. It's not the original. So we're interested in it. I don't think it has quite the dark tonal qualities of the original. So we're interested in that. This is, the pro this is where, we are, you know, where we are, modeling the rooms, beginning to create the space. And we find ourselves having to really dig through archival material to get at things like door moldings, wall treatments that we need to have. And so that's just a, an overview of the kinds of projects we've been doing that are focused around the delivery mechanism of Unity, the game engine, but obviously have a lot of broad implications for distance uh, education in the arts. So that's what I got.